This program is brought to you by the Foundation for Ancient Research and Mormon Studies. This lecture is one in a series exploring the message of the Book of Mormon and its invitation to everyone to come unto Christ. The speaker is Noel B. Reynolds. The title of this lecture is The Gospel as Taught by the Nephites. Well, I'm glad to welcome each of you here today. Uh, what we're going to be talking about is the Gospel of Jesus Christ as taught by the Nephite prophets. So what that means is we'll be looking specifically at the Book of Mormon and the teachings in which they define what the Gospel is. The Book of Mormon and other LDS scriptures define the term Gospel quite precisely uh, as the way or means by which an individual can come back to Christ. So it's a, the means of returning to Christ. In these scriptures, uh, the Gospel is the teaching that if people will believe in Christ and then repent of their sins, and then submit to baptism in water as a witness of their willingness to take the name of Christ upon them and keep his commandments, he will pour out his spirit upon them, forgive them for their sins, and that all who receive this baptism of fire, as it's called in the Book of Mormon, and then endure to the end of their lives in faith and in hope and in charity, will be found guiltless at the last day and be saved in the kingdom of God. Now, I said all of that in one sentence, but it is, it's a, a series of six items that add up to what the Book of Mormon presents as the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Now that's just an introduction. Uh, I do want to tell you that uh, what I'm going to be presenting here has been published uh, in BYU Studies in 1991, the summer issue of Volume 31, uh, in a, a paper there, so you can refer to that for details, for scripture references, and so forth, if, uh, if you have further interest. The Book of Mormon, we are told three times in the uh, Doctrine and Covenants, in the revelations given to Joseph Smith, the Book, uh, the Book of Mormon contains the fullness of the Gospel of Christ. Uh, you can look, for example, at uh, Doctrines and Covenants uh, section 20, verse 9. Uh, you may want to look at that with me. And here we have... <coughs> Uh, the statement that Joseph Smith has been given power from on high in verse 8 to translate the Book of Mormon, which in verse 9 contains a record of a fallen people and the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles and to the Jews also. It goes on and says other important things about it, but if you look at each of these three references that I've indicated for you here, uh, you will see that they say similar kinds of things. The Book of Mormon contains the fullness of the Gospel. Well, so what we're going to be asking today is, what is that Gospel? Now, I want each of you to just think for a minute, what is the Gospel? What, if someone had asked you before you came into this room, how would you have defined the Gospel? Just think about that for just a second. And then, after we're done, I want you to compare what you now think the Gospel is with what you had thought. And I think you will see that the Book of Mormon gives a more precise kind of definition than you might have expected. In this second visual, I want to show you that the Gospel of Jesus Christ is a phrase that occurs widely in the scriptures, but a phrase that means the same thing is the doctrine of Jesus Christ. Now, we might want to think those were two different things, but that is not the case. As is pointed out, for example, uh, and I will just race through some of these, you might look at uh, Jacob chapter 7, verse 6. And here you will find uh, Jacob, who is the prophet who succeeded Nephi, being confronted uh, with one of the great enemies of his church, uh, being challenged, 
uh, and criticized for what he teaches the people. And it is said, and it came to pass that this apostate came unto me, and on this wise did he speak unto me, saying, Brother Jacob, I have sought much opportunity that I might speak unto you, for I have heard and also know that thou goest about much, preaching that which ye, ca ye call the gospel or the doctrine of Christ. Jacob was calling them, using both terms for the same thing. Now you'll see from the examples we'll give that uh, uh, as we go through this, uh, that that is the case. Uh, we have uh, other references here in which uh, Nephi, for example, in that great vision that he had and explaining that vision to his brothers afterwards refers to this gospel of Christ. And then at the end of 2 Nephi, when Nephi is presenting to his posterity this book, he's finishing this writing, the small plates, his part of it. Uh, he says that he is going to teach them some things about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then as he starts out doing that, and let's now look at 2 Nephi chapter 31, verse 2, he calls it the doctrine of Christ. He says, Wherefore the things which I have written sufficeth me, save it be, a few words which I must speak concerning the doctrine of Christ. And so we get Nephi then uh, moving into his the first of the Book of Mormon's systematic presentations or definitions of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, what does the word gospel mean? What does the word teaching mean? And I have put uh, on the screen here for you this, uh, the Greek term didaskalia. And what that is, that is translated teaching. And that is the word that occurs in your New Testament as doctrine. When it talks about my doctrine, their doctrine, his doctrine, it's a teaching. Uh, it also, the word gospel, is, is used in the New Testament to, f to translate a term which means the good news. So the teaching of Christ or the good news about Christ, or the good news of the atonement. That's, that's, what, uh, that's what these two terms mean, but they're used to refer to the same thing. Does that uh, make sense to you? Good. Now, the next thing I want to uh, show you is that the Book of Mormon offers us three complete uh, statements of the Gospel of Christ. And it identifies them as such. And it's actually rather remarkable the way this occurs. Because each of these three statements that you see here on the screen uh, begins and ends with a statement that this is the gospel or this is the doctrine of Christ. Isn't that interesting? I mean, it's, it's hard to get mixed up uh, about what's going on. It, these are book end statements, the beginning and end. Those of you that have studied literature know that authors often do this kind of thing. They give you book end statements to show that there's a unit, some literary unit there that's important for you, the reader, to recognize. Well, we have this three times in the Book of Mormon. Now, a further interesting uh, thing about this is as we look at each of these passages that are actually given as quotations from Christ. So as this is presented in the Book of Mormon in these three systematic passages, it's actually presented as quotations from Jesus himself. Or in the first case we have here, 2 Nephi chapter 31, Nephi is pulling together statements from the Father and the Son, and presenting them to us to give us this definition of the gospel or of Jesus Christ. Now, uh, why? L l well, let's just look at one of these so that you can see it. The one we have just read. Uh, I'm in 2 Nephi chapter 31, verse 2, and where he says, First, I must speak a few words concerning the doctrine of Christ. Now, if we go to the end of that chapter, just... Uh, what is it, about uh, 19 verses later, he says, and now, my beloved brethren, this is the way. And there is none other way given nor name, nor name given, excuse me, under heaven whereby man can be saved. And now behold, this is the doctrine of Christ. And the only and true doctrine of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost without end, amen. I mean, you... He's, he's trying to tell you something, isn't he? 
He has said something that he thinks is very important at that point. Well, we'll go back in a minute and look and see what that was uh, that he said to us. And what that doctrine of Christ contains turns out to be a formula. Uh, he doesn't use the word formula, but I'll, I'll talk about that in just a moment. But let's first look at the contents of that formula. And as you start to look down this list that I have, uh, you'll see that looks pretty familiar. Uh, no surprises today. Uh, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ is, starts, is based on the idea of faith in Jesus Christ. That's why it's named after him. It's faith, belief, or faith in Jesus Christ. The second requirement is repentance. Those, if you believe in Christ, and that what he says is true, what is the next step? Can you live just any old way and be saved? No, you have to do what he tells you, and he stands for a, a very high standard. That's a standard of sinlessness. Well, that's a big problem, isn't it? That's a big problem for everybody. If you believe in Christ, then what do you do about your sins? You can deny them. A lot of people try that. But if you admit them to yourself, you realize you need to do something. And what does he tell you to do? Repent of them. Give them up. And what goes with the repentance? How do you demonstrate to Jesus and to the Father that you have repented, that you're determined to follow his commandments and not to sin anymore? Baptism. You, you, you ask for baptism. And baptism is something you do. You say to the person in authority, I want to be baptized. And if you qualify, they will allow you to be baptized. So it's an, it's an act of yours to be baptized. Now the next step is, what does God do for those who are baptized, who have truly repented? He blesses them in return with a second baptism. He baptizes them back with the Holy Ghost. It's called the baptism of fire or the Holy Spirit, as Nephi explains it. And is that it? I mean, lots of Christians today teach you, if you've had this experience with the Spirit of God, you have it made. You are saved. What does Nephi say? <clears throat> it's not quite over. In fact, you have to endure all the way to the end of your life in these covenants that you have made. And we will see that he elaborates that. Uh, he explains to us that enduring to the end is a process that involves faith. Faith isn't just a starting point. Faith is for all of your life. And hope once you have received the Spirit into your life, you then have reason to hope that maybe God will accept you. He's accepted you once, forgiven you of your sins. Maybe he will accept you at the end. So you hope. And finally, charity. Because now that you have overcome your sins and have felt the love of God in your life, you can love other people in a way that you never have before. Because you're not caught up in your problems, your identity, uh, your sins, trying to justify yourself. That's past. You're justified because Christ accepts you, because the Father accepts you. And you're free to love other people in the same way that he does. And he blesses you with that. And that charity is called the pure love of Christ as it comes through this process. Well, what is the gift that comes to those who receive all of this? What is the greatest of all the gifts of God? Eternal, Eternal life, or salvation, as it's referred to mostly in the Book of Mormon. They will be saved. Nephi uses both phrases. We sometimes want to distinguish those phrases, but the Book of Mormon doesn't make a distinction. They're just uh, used the same way. Well, why would this be presented to us as a formula. Do you think about that? I mean, is it the kind of, is it just a mechanical process that we could just, you know, bang, 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 you do this and there you are, you get eternal life? Is, uh, it's like a checklist of things that you can uh, 
work out, you know, how to get an A in the classes. You know, sometimes your teacher will present you with, you know, if you want to get an A in this class, here are the requirements, you do them all, you get an A, right? Matt, do you have a well, comment there? Sometimes when we have formulas or ways that steps to follow, they become like goals and we know mm -hmm. what we need to do in order to return to or, or to live the gospel. We know how to follow it. Well, I think that's exactly the point. It's, it's, it's educational. In other words, a formula makes it easier for us to understand, to think about it. It's, in other words, it's a pedagogical or explanatory device. Uh, but it's not mechanical. The formula doesn't save you. Knowing the formula doesn't save you. Where do you get the knowledge that you will need to endure to the end and be saved? Scriptures are a great source of that knowledge. What does Nephi say will tell you all things what you should do? The Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost, he says in the very next chapter, after he's finished this, this discourse, and we'll, go, we'll come across this again, will tell you all things what you should do in this process of enduring to the end. And so it's the Spirit that will lead us to salvation, not the formula. But the formula is a, a help. It's a way of explaining to us the process by which we can come back to our Father in Heaven. So it's a teaching device. And Joseph Smith was the first to seize on it. Uh, in the history of the church, uh, he gives us the, what he called the first principles and ordinances of the gospel. Well, that is a kind of a summary of this little formula, isn't it? Uh, you know those four... You've, you memorize those, one of the articles of faith, uh, you understand what that is. Um, finally, uh, I want to make one other distinction before we go back to Nephi. Is the gospel the same as the plan of salvation? Now think of these five little points. What are the main elements of the plan of salvation? Preexistence, creation, fall, atonement, all of the judgment, do you see there's a, that the gospel is a part of the plan of salvation. It's the message that, or that makes it possible for us to take full advantage of the plan of salvation. But the two terms, they're different things, aren't they? they each, each term has its own meaning. So we don't want to get that mixed up. Uh, any question or comment about that? Yes. I was just going to say, then we can look at that when we speak of the fullness of the gospel, we can think of it as, as not receiving everything, everything that we're going to receive eventually. For example, in the, in the Book of Mormon, we don't talk about endowments or celestial marriage, mm -hmm. but yet it's everything that we need to put ourselves um, on the straight and narrow path. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I think we're ready to go back and... <coughs> and start going through 2 Nephi. So if you want to do that with me, uh, we'll turn to chapter 31 and see how Nephi does this. I don't know how recently you've read 2 Nephi. Uh, let's just look at a little bit of this uh, together and then uh, we'll start to analyze it. But uh, this is the chapter in which Nephi recounts this experience of uh, the Father and the, uh, of seeing the baptism of Christ by John the Baptist. Now, how does Nephi see that? I mean, Nephi lives over 500 years before John the Baptist, and he's a continent and an ocean, or two continents and an ocean away. Yes, it's a vision, isn't it? And we know that Nephi had such a vision because he tells us about it in 1st Nephi chapter 11. Any other sources? Who else saw the vision of John the Baptist baptizing Jesus? <coughs> Lehi. In fact, Nephi was just, had just asked the Lord to see the vision his father had seen. Right. And they both speak of this. And if you look, and I won't take time to demonstrate this to you right now, but if you look carefully, at, the, at Lehi's report of that vision 
And then Nephi's report of that vision, back in 1 Nephi, I think you will see that 2 Nephi chapter 31 isn't a new vision. It's Nephi giving a more detailed description of what he saw and heard the first time. And some of the same language and phrases pop up as Nephi does that. Uh, but I'll leave that uh, for you to do on your own. Uh, Nephi chooses to emphasize this concept that he hears that, that the son, pardon me, that the, he hears the father say to him when he sees the baptism of Jesus in his vision. And that is that all men should follow him. And that Christ says, they should follow me. And Nephi concludes, we should follow him. In other words, we should follow his example. And what is his example? What did he do? Well, Nephi explains it to us as if Jesus is going through these six steps. Now, that's a little strange because Jesus didn't have sins, did he? Uh, but, but Nephi does it that way, and let, let's look at this and see how he, how he handles it. First of all, I want to point out to you, Nephi presents our little formula five times in these 19 verses. So it isn't just once. He, pre he presents it first, then he does it again, then he does it again, and again, and again. Hmm. And each time he does it, he, he twists, he puts a little different angle on, a little different spin, adds a little detail here, doesn't repeat something he said before. So each one is a little different. But when we add them up, we get a comprehensive portrayal of what the gospel of Jesus Christ is. Let's try that uh, by looking through it. Starting in verse 4, he says, um, Remember I've told you about the prophet that would baptize the Lamb of God? So he tells us where he's going to start, what his reference point is. He says, Now, if the Lamb of God, being holy, should have need to be baptized by water to fulfill all righteousness, how much more need we, being unholy, and to be baptized, yea, even by water. So where is he starting in our formula? Starting with baptism, is he? He's kind of starting in the middle. Okay. And now I would ask you, wherein the Lamb of God did fulfill all righteousness in being baptized? Know ye not that he was holy, but notwithstanding he being holy, he showed us, according to the flesh, he humbled himself before the Father. Now what is that in our formula? It's repentance. Now, does Jesus repent? No. no. Not having sinned, but even not being sinful. He humbles himself in the attitude of a repentant person. So, we, does, we should be humble even if we haven't sinned, but, uh, but certainly being sinful, uh, all, all the more need for us to humble. And then witness to the Father, I'm still in verse 7, that he would be obedient to him in keeping his commandments. How did he do that? Through the baptism. That's the baptism. Wherefore, after he was baptized <coughs> with the water, what happens? The Holy Ghost descended upon him in the form of a dove. And again it showeth unto the children of men the straightness of the path and the narrowness of the gate by which they should enter. He having set the example before them. So what has Jesus shown us by his example? The basic principles of the gospel. Okay, and the path to that, the, these principles are a path, aren't they, that will take us back. And how do we get in? There's a narrow gate. What is the gate? Baptism. And, and repentance. Repentance and baptism. Okay, we're picking this up well. And <laughs> Nephi, Nephi's going to like us. You watch when he reviews this in a minute, he'll say, you already got it. But for everybody else, he explains it again. And so in verse 11, here we have, And the Father said, Repent ye, repent ye, and be baptized. This is the second time around, isn't it? We're getting repetition here. And also the voice of the Son. Who are his authorities? Can you get any better than this? See, this is the, these are the voices Nephi heard in this vision, or that his father heard in his vision. And also the voice of the Son came, came saying, He that has baptized in my name, to him will the Father give the Holy Ghost, like unto me. So if he did it, he'd do it for you the way he did it for me. 
Wherefore, follow me. And this is Nephi's point. Nephi's seen the example being the issue here. And do the things which ye have seen me do. Seen me do. And so what does Nephi do? Okay, that's, it's been presented twice. And Nephi says in verse 13, now Nephi gives us his own summary. He says, wherefore, my beloved brethren, I know. How does he know? He saw Jesus do it in vision, and he heard the voice of the Father and the Son both saying it twice. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, speaking to his own uh, people and to his descendants as he's writing this, I know that if ye shall follow the Son, again the example of the following business, with full purpose of heart, acting no hypocrisy and no deception. What's this getting back to? Sincere repentance, right? But with real intent, repenting of your sins, witnessing unto the Father that you are willing to take upon you the name of Christ by baptism. How do we witness? Baptism. By baptism. Baptism is our witness to Him. Yea, by following your Lord and your Savior down into the water according to his word, behold, then shall ye receive the Holy Ghost. Yea, then cometh the baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost. And then, what, can, what happens after you've received that baptism? Then can ye speak with the tongue of angels and shout praises unto the Holy One of Israel. So at that, that point, you can speak in this way. But then, and now he goes back in and starts quoting again and gives us the third, pardon me, now it's the fourth, isn't it? The fourth repetition, uh, starting in verse 14. But behold, my beloved brethren, thus came the voice of the Son unto me, saying, After ye have repented in your sins and witnessed unto the Father that you are willing to keep my commandments by the baptism of water and have received the baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost, click, 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 then what? And can speak with the new tongue of angels and all this, if you deny me, it would have been better for you that ye had not known me. So there's, the gospel is good news and bad news, right? And I heard a voice from the Father saying, Yea, the words of my beloved are true and faithful. He that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. That's verse 16, 7, uh, pardon me, 15. He that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. So after you've received the Holy Ghost, could speak with the tongue of angels and all these things, is it over? Then, who said? The Father speaks and reaffirms the necessity of all that and says, but he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. Well, Nephi says, now my beloved brethren, this, by this means, I know. And so now Nephi gives us his summary in these last five verses. This is the fifth presentation in these 19 verses. By this, Nephi says, I know that unless a man shall endure to the end, in following the example of the Son of the living God, he cannot be saved. So the first principles and ordinances are following the example and then endure to the end and be saved. Wherefore, Nephi says, do the things which I have told you I have seen that your Lord and Redeemer should do. For for this cause have they been shown to me that ye might know the gate by which ye should enter. For, now you folks already know this, but Nephi is repeating it just in case somebody missed it. The gate by which ye should enter is repentance and baptism by water. And then cometh a remission of your sins by fire and by the Holy Ghost. What, what brings the remission of sins? Holy Ghost. Not the baptism by water. Are you confused about that? Mm -hmm. See, I, I know that we often, you know, eight-year-olds, when they're baptized, see the water very often, and they're told that it's the water that brings the remission of sins. But the remission of sins is the gift of God that comes afterwards. We show our covenant to the, we witness to the Father that we will do these things. That's, baptism is our thing. We're the ones that go into the water. He chooses whether or not to forgive our sins, right? Everybody gets washed in the water. The truly repentant are forgiven. And the witness of that is the Holy Ghost that comes to them. 
this baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost. And then cometh the remission of your sins by fire and by the Holy Ghost. It's not the washing metaphor, it's the burning cleansing metaphor, isn't it? Cleansing by fire. And then, are ye in the straight and narrow path which leads to eternal life? You have entered the gate, you have done according to the commandments of the Father, you have received the Holy Ghost, he's summarizing it all again, which witnesses of the Father and the Son unto the fulfilling of the promise. So the Holy Ghost, when it comes to you, witnesses that the promise has been fulfilled. What promise? If you would repent and do these things, you would receive the Spirit and the remission of sins. So this is the fulfillment of the promise, fulfilling of the promise which he hath made, that if he entered in by the way, what's that mean? Repent, repent and be baptized, ye would receive what? The Spirit and the remission of sins. See? And now, my beloved brethren, after ye have gotten into this straight and narrow path, what's missing? Faith. Yeah. What about faith? I mean, we really think faith's important, don't we? Well, doesn't Nephi? Has he mentioned it? I mean, it does. It sounds like he has faith, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. I mean, after all, uh, what's he talking about? But he hasn't mentioned it, has he? Well, let's keep going. After ye have gotten into this straight and narrow path, I would ask if all is done, what do we see coming up? Endure to the end, right? Mm -hmm. Is all done. We would ask if all is done. Behold, I say, nay, for ye have not come this far, save it were by the word of Christ, with unshaken faith in him. So how did you get to this point? Repentance, baptism, gift of the Holy Ghost? Faith. By faith. That was the way you, that's how you got here. <laughs> so no, now we don't have to worry, do we? We're, we can relax. Nephi got it right. Um, unshaken faith in him, relying wholly upon the merits of him who is mighty to save. Wherefore, ye must press forward with a steadfastness in Christ. What does that mean? What, what part of our formula does steadfastness in Christ refer to? Okay, faith. Is, is that steadfast that, uh, in, in Christ? It's faith, isn't it? Watch how the rest of it comes, and you'll see why, why it is faith. Steadfastness in Christ, having a perfect brightness of hope and a love of God and of all men. Charity, faith, hope, and charity is the means by which we do what? Endure to the end. Wherefore, if ye shall press forward, feasting upon the word of Christ, and endure to the end, behold, thus saith the Father, ye shall have eternal life. See how Nephi just, it, it, he just weaves it very tightly around this little formula, but in the process of repeating it so many times, he, it helps us understand in, in more detail how each of these principles of the gospel works. Now, we've taken a long time in this discussion to go through 2 Nephi chapter 31. Now, what I want to show you is that if we turn over now to 3 Nephi, and we'll start in chapter 9, but not take the time to go through it in this kind of detail, you will see that the same kind of thing happens again. Was there any question on any of that? Yes? I just wanted to make a comment yeah. that it's amazing how many times he repeats it, yet we still fail to follow it as people. It's going to get repeated some more here. In fact, what I want to end is by showing you just how often this really is taught and why we can see that the, the Book of Mormon really does contain the fullness of the Gospel and why President Benson and the Doctrine and Covenants and others encourage us so much to read the Book of Mormon carefully. Uh, what I really want to show you is chapter 11 uh, of uh, Third Nephi, uh, starting in verse 31. Now, chapter 9 does present the Gospel and you get four little presentations of it. That's when Christ first speaks to the Nephites and he tells them repent and be baptized and you'll receive the Holy Ghost. But now 
uh, in chapter 11. Uh, he has appeared to them, he's speaking to them, and he says, Behold, verily I say unto you, I will declare unto you my doctrine. Here we see it coming, don't we? Just like Nephi did. And this is my doctrine, again. And it is the doctrine which the Father hath given unto me. I mean, it's got to be really sleepy scripture reading time if you don't get the point what you're going to, what you're going to get here. And I bear record of the Father, and the Father beareth record of me, and so forth. Uh, and whoso believeth in me, and is baptized, in verse 33, the same shall be saved, and they are they who shall inherit the kingdom of God. And whoso believeth not in me, and is not baptized, shall be damned. There's the good news, bad news uh, business again. And 35, Verily, verily, I say unto you that this is my doctrine, I bear record of it. Whoso believeth in the Father believeth, uh, believeth in me, and so forth. Uh, well, we don't uh, want to take the time to go through all of this in detail, but we will see that in this presentation, again, Jesus presents uh, faith, uh, baptism, uh, faith, repentance, baptism, the gift of the Holy Ghost, and enduring to the end several times. Uh, we actually have to wait until chapter 15 to get enduring to the end attached to it, but it's implicit uh, throughout. And this is repeated up through uh, the beginning of chapter 12. Then finally, we have the, uh, the appearance of Jesus to his disciples later on. We don't know how much later this is. It could be weeks, it could be years. But the disciples are traveling somewhere, it would appear. Uh, and they are disputing what the name of the church should be. And what's the answer that Jesus appears to them? And he says, why are you confused about this? Church of Christ. Whose gospel is it? It's my gospel that you teach, therefore it should be in my name. Look at Third uh, Nephi chapter 27, and we'll just look at verse 13, for example. He says, Behold, I have given unto you my gospel, and this is the gospel which I have given unto you. And then if you skip down to the end of this passage, uh, verse 21, Verily, verily, I say unto you, this is my gospel. And ye know the things that ye must do in my church, for which ye have seen me, and so forth. So, uh, and if you read through that, it's exactly the same presentation again. And he that endureth not unto the end, the same as he who shall be hewn down, uh, after explaining that they must repent, be baptized, they will be filled with the Holy Ghost, they must endure to the end, and they will be saved. So, we don't have, um, we're not left wondering what the gospel of Christ is, if we will read this and read it carefully. Now, I want to make one final point. In the uh, Bible, for instance, the Old Testament, the New Testament, in other ancient literatures, when you have a formula, uh, as we do have here, where we have six elements in the formula, notice that you can get someone to think about that formula, to have it come to their mind, just by mentioning certain parts of it. Now this, if you want to put this in your list of something new you've learned today, this is called merismus, or a merism. A merism is a rhetorical device, or it's a writing device, by which you can name the first and the last element of a series, this is kind of mathematical, and that will bring to the mind of the person the entire series. For example, believe in me and be saved. Now, you know there are religions that take that literally. think all you have to do is believe in Christ and be saved, right? But once you realize that this is a standard technique, what does that make you think? Yes, believe and be saved are items one, first and last. This is the A and the Z, right? and you've got to fill in the in-between, and you know what it is. I won't uh, uh, belabor this, but I would just point out that in going through the Book of Mormon very quickly, making a conservative count, I find 130 statements of the Gospel of Christ that are meristic, that is, like this. 
where the, the formula is suggested by the presentation of two key terms, often the last term with one or more of the earlier terms. So it's a, so when you don't see the formula splattered all over on every page, you've got to remember that you're being spoken to by someone who thinks that you can think. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, and that the, the mentioning parts of it will bring the whole thing to mind because all the parts have been presented very systematically to you. Well, I hope that this helps uh, the way you will think about the gospel of Jesus Christ and that you will understand why the Doctrine and Covenants emphasizes that the fullness of the Gospel of Christ is presented in the Book of Mormon. I want to share with you my testimony that I know that this teaching of Christ is true, that this is the only way by which human beings can come back into the presence of their Father in Heaven, and I say it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. For more information about the Book of Mormon and other related topics, call 1-800-327-6715.